where we've had a great time celebrating on the river with families and friends. The fireworks have gone up to a whole new level of spectacular. And a few days later, we start to uh, hear news about uh, an upcoming flood event. Our children, or perhaps our children's children, won't need to rely on us for our memories of the 2011 floods because they'll have access to data similar to what the Bureau is receiving, similar to what emergency management organisations are receiving, and also access to communities and community data and information. And that information will come in ways that will be neatly translated uh, and more meaningful to community members to help guide decision making. We'll also be able to get a read of how the community are feeling. So we'll know some people are feeling anxious, some people are perhaps feeling excited. Uh, some are feeling reassured by understanding what measures are being put in place by the organisations around them. Our alerts to start to prepare begin to filter to us. And these come in really interesting ways. So we might get pinged by the fridge as we open the door to grab some milk being alerted that our Coles delivery, which comes every, um, every Monday, is uh, going to include some extra disaster supplies because the event uh, may, turn, may shift into something that we require some supplies for that aren't in our fridge or in our pantry. And of course, everything is connected and everyone knows us and how we operate and that it actually takes a disaster, an imminent disaster, to start uh, thinking about preparedness. As we make our coffee, we're reminded by the machine while it percolates that we should start thinking about what our priorities might be for the next few days. Where are our family? Where are our friends? What are the priorities we have to secure our homes? And what are some of the important pieces of work that we have in our professional lives? And of course, at this point, we may not be actually commuting to work. Work may be activities that we do within our home environment um, or within coffee shops. In 2036, the way that we interact with technology will be very different. But some things won't change. We will critique um, our messages and we will critique media and communication. Uh, we will also be looking at trust in different kinds of ways and it will cause different problems uh, and the way we believe information and act on information will also shift. So it's hard to predict, well, I have just <laughs> changed the slides, apologies, hard to predict um, what particular platforms we might be using in 2036. So those of you know, Facebook and Twitter have been around for about 10 years now. Whether they will still be around in 10 years time or 20 years time and in what form is really difficult to predict at this point. But what will be interesting is whether our views on privacy and whether privacy is important to us and to what level will be important because that will depend and drive the types of data and the types of information that we share and then that we also receive as community members. Uh, and we will be fallible. So even though we might have the best quality information put in front of us as community members, we still have to process that information. We still have our own biases, our own shortcuts, um, and our own hiccups. But hopefully some of the devices around our home will also be aware of some of our idiosyncrasies and ping us or communicate to us in ways that may overcome some of those decision-making blockers or may actually encourage us to, um, to change. Communities will also be very powerful in their ability to self-organise. Uh, and we've seen that already uh, in recent events, but in 2036, the way that we do that may also bypass our communication with existing channels, existing authorities, um, and that presents challenges and opportunities in our sector. The networks that we are part of drive communication and they will help us see beyond ourselves and beyond immediate and short-term decisions which can sometimes lead to consequences that we may not expect. So as communities and individuals evolve in their own practices 
and the designs um, and, and the way these networks look, our expectations for organisations and our expectations for each other and, um, and the community members and ourselves will also change. But what becomes something that is taken for granted in this space is that the community and the individual is at the heart of all communication and that is the central piece for today. Right, so as we can see, we're tag teaming on this one. Um, there we go. So uh, the, uh, you've heard from Amisha just now about how people are engaging in this, in this ne network world, even more network world of the 2030s. Um, of course, people aren't alone in this. Um, we are also in, in, this, in this environment, in this future environment, going to be able to draw on a lot of other things that are also part of the networks, devices, sensors of various forms. Um, so, for example, uh, all of the personal devices that we carry on ourselves will, of course, also generate their own information, share that information with the network. Many other devices around, around the place, fixed and mobile devices, will themselves also be networked and generate information. There's probably going to be a, a network access for every street lamp, for every traffic light, for every other piece of infrastructure that, that is, uh, is powered in some form will be connected to the network as well. We have all the fridges, we have all the other devices, the, the internet toasters and whatever else there might be by then um, that are also part of the network. And of course all of these constantly generate data, all of these constantly generate information. Um, and that information may also in the end become useful uh, in terms of providing data for situational awareness. So we're getting to a point where um, we can actually draw potentially on all of these data points to understand what the situation on the ground is. For example, the streetlights that have their own network connections. When those connections go offline, we can assume that the flood has reached them and they've now shorted out. Um, for example, we can see all the sensors that are in our cars and, and track their movements around the place. Uh, and work out from those mov movement patterns which roads are still passable, which ones are not. So well beyond the power of the, uh, the, the, the great work of the emergency services that are uh, dealing with the event, we can draw on even more information to actually understand what the patterns are, the detailed patterns are on the ground all over the place. Um, that will become a very, very important aspect of dealing with any crisis in the future. It already is in many ways, but of course, this will simply be amplified further and further as we go on from here, and as more and more of these devices, um, mobile or otherwise, are, are networked. And this is, of course, what some people describe as the Internet of Things. Um, so we have all of this data potentially available to ourselves. Of course, with certain issues around privacy, around access and so on that would need to be addressed. Um, and of course, at the same time too, uh, we will be deluged by, by the data in the same way as we are in the scenario by the water itself. So we also have to find ways to deal with this uh, this overflow, this, this amazing amount of, of information that we're now dealing with. So we will also need um, data processing. We will need data analysis approaches. We will need algorithms that deal uh, with all of these data points and filter out from that what is actually situationally relevant, what of this is actually worth pursuing, worth feeding into the, uh, the emergency response as we uh, deal with the flood crisis itself. And that is going to be one of the big challenges. Actually, um, training up the staff, having the right infrastructure, having the right computational power, having the right networks of agencies that can actually deal with all of this information um, as we go. So putting all of this together, we are now dealing with um, a far more informational world, a far more network world um, in Australia in 2036 than we have even now. Um, we may even by then have broadband, we can hope, but um, certainly, <laughs> certainly by that point we will have a great deal of devices that are constantly communicating with each other, with us, with the general world, and we have a lot of data that we can draw on uh, for enhancing the emergency response, enhancing um, the amount of situational information that we actually have about what's going on on the ground. Is that Emma? So the points that Excel and Misha have, have raised about the way the community is going to communicate in the future and the devices and the platforms we use to communicate and the data that we're going to generate, we know that that's technically all possible. Um, 
but what's interesting to think about and particularly for a lot of you given uh, the organizations you come from is uh, whether whether this information and this data is going to be used and whether organizations are equipped to handle this data and to make use of this data. Um, because at the moment, there are existing organizational hurdles that will continue to perpetuate um, and which we do need to overcome to make use of all that data. So there are a few requirements. Um, first of all, technological advancement and research and development uh, is really important. So Excel raised um, you know, big data concerns and, and the ability to process, process that information. I've just realized I've stopped clicking. Oh, there we go. Um, so we need more significant data mining tools uh, to be developed in conjunction with practitioners to ensure that the timely information generated from social media or um, whatever platforms will be around in the future uh, to ensure that that data is quickly leveraged and act acted upon. And it's really important for organisations to work in collaboration with universities, with the private sector, to ensure that the tools that they're developing are actual, actually useful for their particular context. And also there are um, requirements, there are uh, financial requirements and staffing requirements. So um, emergency management organisations and government organisations typically prioritise quantifiable on the ground resources. That's understandable, you know, it's easier to justify, for example, a fire truck on the ground or an ambulance on the ground versus investment in technology to process information that we get from the community to understand what is going on at, at their back door or, you know, just down the road from them. But we need this investment to be able to make use of all that data, to make use of those eyes on the ground. Um, the other thing Amisha raised was uh, concerns around privacy. And we've seen uh, these uh, concerns raised in recent months, years, uh, in regards to uh, terrorist threats and, and information security. But it's really important that uh, legal frameworks allow access, allow these organisations, emergency management organisations, government organisations, allow access to the data that the community generates so that they can make use of it. Um, because at the moment, a lot of this, this data, and certainly in the future, a lot of this data will be useful, but there are privacy concerns preventing access to that sort of data. Now, a lot of this is too big for one particular organisation to manage on its own. So we need collaboration between organisations to ensure that there is funding available to create platforms to mine them for data and to make use of that data. But it's also important to ensure that uh, the, divor the diversity of these organisations and the diversity of the community is also acknowledged because what goes on in Bundaberg, for example, is quite different to what goes on in Brisbane, but equally what goes on in Queensland in general is quite different to what goes on in Victoria because we have different uh, disaster contexts which affect people differently and also the resilience of some particular communities who face the same disasters year after year is quite different to, say, a community that doesn't have frequent flood events or bushfires or what, whatever. Um, so these organisations need to collaborate with one another and it's also really important that they collaborate with the community members themselves because they know what issues they have, they know what they need um, when a big flood event comes if they've experienced it year after year. So it's important uh, because these communities do self-organise, it is important um, that agencies tap into that knowledge and make use of that knowledge. Um, and just to end, uh, I, I guess I want to kind of end with a question of power because um, with all the best technology and advice and knowledge, uh, is it possible for all this to break through existing power structures? Because we know uh, during disasters, during flood events, during bushfires, any sort of um, big event, um, there are existing political structures and political interests that dictate how uh, the disaster management process is run. So I think it's important to, to end thinking about whether we can overcome these political structures and these power structures to introduce change, to introduce new technologies, to introduce new data mining platforms so that we can make use of uh, the community and the information that they're generating. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, so um, who's in their 30s? Raise your hand. Who's in their early 40s? Raise your hand. Okay, you guys are going to be productive, employed, and active after what's called the singularity, which they expect will hit around 2045, 10 years from now. That's that period when machine intelligence surpasses human intelligence. And if you're not feeling uncomfortable yet, just write a little note. Google Ray Kurzweil, Life Extension 2045. And begin to understand that your kids will have significant non-biological components in their bodies that are actually accessing the cloud. And when you think about who we share information with, just reflect that Airbnb is now the world's biggest hotel chain. People are OK sharing with Uber quite a bit about their credit card and who they are and have profiles. So you know, in that spirit, when I first learned about how emergency management works, we are graced by the presence of men and women in uniform who command and control all manner of important things when the proverbial hits the fan. What does command and control actually mean? Ian McKinsey, how do you begin to think about this idea of self-reliance, self-organization, what the businesses and residents of the future are doing then compared to now? I think, um, first of all, I think ev every session like this needs a provocateur. Um, so if you'll allow me that privilege, I'm going to start by saying we are only talking about 20 years in the future, not a future state. We, we've heard a lot about technology. We've heard a lot about advances in the internet of things. Um, who here is, and I think you mentioned uh, an age there, so let me, let me, without putting anybody's age at risk, say, who does not intend to be in the workforce in Queensland in 20 years' time? <laughs> so, so we are the vulnerable of the future. So when we think about how people will be in 20 years and how we put them together, um, I think we've got to think about how we will be. Because the, the leaders, those in command and taking control and issuing directions and considering technology, um, I, for one, will not be thinking about how they've used that technology. I will be thinking about how I feel. And as leaders today, that's what we will be judged on after every event. How did we make people feel? Um, so I think there's, there's an absolute need for us to turn how we do business on its head. Um, Mara mentioned to me before lunch the triangle of disaster management arrangements in Australia, that is just fundamentally the wrong shape. It needs to be a circle. It needs to have a target in the middle and the target needs to be the community. And that community is either individuals or businesses and we need to think about how we make them feel in the future. So that would be uh, my challenge to all of you, especially the uniformed, my ex-colleagues up the back. It's, it's how we engage with the community and how we serve them. If I may add something as well, um, I think there's been a lot of talk about, for example, in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, how we act actually capture the impact. And there's been a lot of talk about we send drones up, we send um, some sort of vehicle out to actually capture a, a satellite to capture the extent of the damage. It's our experience that as we get older and that the number of single um, inhabitant homes increases, you really have to look at the stratification of your community and what their support networks are. And I'll tell you a little story. Back in 2012, we were in Roma, and it's an obviously an aged rural population where the partner had passed on, and there were a lot of old people in that community. The flood had passed through, and they were sitting in their homes waiting for help to come. So ultimately, we can capture all, all of the impacts from a particular disaster um, electronically, but it's the people that matter and who provides their support and that network and how we deal with that in 2036, which is a really big issue that we need to contemplate as well. Please uh, feel free to ask questions or we can keep going back and forth on the panel. Um, I guess one of my, oh please Mike, go. Uh, I was just gonna pick up a point that uh, Mark uh, raised earlier on and we talked about the community being at the heart um, of where we go into the future. Um, and I think the point that Mark was, was making 
that we've got a community at the moment in relation to emergency from warnings and, and their expectations about what the authorities can do, um, the ECQ water, what we can do with our wonderful dams. That's an ingrained perception. So we can talk a lot about technology and, and where that may go, but I think one of the challenges we all face is how do we move community understanding to where we need it to be? And I'll also pose that question, if we're in emergencies, we also talked about this the demand for information and let's flood the community, let's be as uh, transparent as we can, flood the community with information, but what do they actually need to know at that time? Um, but I think, that, I think fundamentally we have a scenario, and it's not uniquely South East Queensland, but we've got a scenario where we've got a community that over the years, um, despite 2011, they're still lulled into this. Uh, there is a sense of security um, that when the time comes, that will, the authorities will be stepping up uh, and they wait and they receive. So I think that's, that's a fundamental challenge we all face. So let, let's reflect on that. We have a few minutes left, and I might even encourage George, who's busily taking notes, to reflect on something that's been taxing me for some time, which is, you know, we have this political cycle. The reason why we don't have a lot of local government here actively engaged is because we're about to go into local council elections, aren't we? And then we're about to go into federal elections, and then, oh my God, we're back into state elections. It's like every five minutes, right? And what do politicians offer? Security. You know, vote for me, more police, more safe laws, more safe dams, whatever it is. How do we flick this culture? How do we get to the heart of this? You know, we on the ground are the ones that are going to be stuck without power for a week. We have to work together. We can't just rely on someone in a uniform to magically appear. We have a number of social researchers in the audience. Does anyone ha want to have a go at that? Or, you know, possibly it relates also to... Um, the, the, the response of communities on the ground. I think we have someone from Red Cross here. How is it that we turn this idea on its head while still being in this political cycle of we will fix it for you? Peter Channels, you're stuck with this question. Here, grab a mic, what do you reckon? So Peter and I crossed paths when he was at AG's. He is a luminary in this space. Uh, I don't think you do, um, to be honest. Uh, I'll pick up Ian's point of being a bit provocateur about it. But I mean, have a look around at uh, the sort of magazines that are in a news agent. Just go and have a look around. Look at the sorts of shows that are on television. There's a whole range of that part of the community that they're just busy leading their lives. They don't give a damn about this. And it doesn't matter how much information you put out there, they're not going to read it, let alone understand it. So the resilience, the further you go from a capital city in the case of Queensland, go out to Longreach, where those people are very resilient. They can sustain no power for a week without a, without a problem, without even blinking an eye. So in, 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 in a city uh, where it's highly reliant, where, it's, where you're starting into the critical infrastructure issue, in particular power and communications, where they drop, the society in, a, in, in an urban, in highly urban environment will really suffer badly. So in terms of building resilience, let's face it, it's fairly simple. There's a river. If it floods, we're going to get wet. And, <laughs> you know, you've just got to work out how, how we can... You're not going to stop the water. You can't divert the water. So, you know, I, the resilience... You've got to live with it. People in Rockhampton, they live there. They get flooded every year, but they love the area. They're going to stay there. North Queensland, Cyclone, same deal. Don't you love flicking the microphone to... Someone who completely reinforced. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. And it's the reason why the Rockefeller Foundation has invested $100 million to pick 100 cities around the world through the 100 Resilient Cities Project. And I've been involved with Melbourne and Sydney's project. And it is all about understanding this question. 75% of the planet will be living in cities by 2070. How do we get around this thing of we take responsibility and don't just watch the telly? 